How's it going, Internet? I'm Tim Stedman, and this is Get Psyched with Tim Stedman, the only show on the Internet where we apply psychology to explain why your latest TikTok video didn't go viral. Today, we're diving into Science Practice 1, Concept Application. In AP Psychology, there are four science practices that you will use throughout the course. These practices are designed to give you hands-on experience in activities like analyzing research, interpreting data, and applying psychological theories to real-world situations, all things that will be tested on the AP Psych exam. Now, before we jump into the specifics of Science Practice 1, if you do end up finding this video helpful, consider subscribing to the channel. Not only does it make me like you more, but it will also keep you posted on when new videos are out, which I don't know about you, but that seems like a pretty solid deal right there. Also, be sure to check out the Get Psyched to Score 5 review guide. It goes along with all these video reviews. It's free, and it'll only increase your chances at scoring well on the AP test. The link for the guide can be found in the video description box below. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's shift our focus to Science Practice 1, Concept Application. Science Practice 1 is all about taking the psychological concepts and theories we learn throughout the course and applying them to things we might experience or see in the real world. Whether it's understanding why we forget where we left our keys, or why a perfectly good sidewalk is ignored in favor of a shortcut across the grass, Science Practice 1 will help us bridge the gap between psychological theory and practical application. Psychology is just going to be the scientific study of the mind and behavior. It explores why we think, feel, and behave the way we do. From understanding our deepest emotions to figuring out why we follow trends or make the decisions we do, psychology helps us unlock the mysteries of human nature. In psychology, we have seven modern perspectives, which are just different approaches in explaining behavior. Psychologists often align with specific perspectives that are close with their beliefs on human behavior. This choice guides their research, the way that they interpret data, and even how they interact with their clients. Each of these perspectives offers a unique look into why we behave the way we do. They help us paint a fuller picture of human behavior from different angles. So how about we go ahead and take a look at these modern perspectives. Emerging in the early 20th century through the work of John B. Watson and later B.F. Skinner, the behavioral perspective focuses on observable behaviors, emphasizing the environment's role in shaping behavior. Psychologists who follow this perspective believe that behaviors are learned responses to external stimuli where learned associations or environmental consequences such as reinforcement or punishment directly influence future actions. The cognitive perspective developed as a reaction to behaviorism in the mid 20th century. Influenced by psychologists such as Jean Piaget and Noam Chomsky, it focuses on the mental processes that direct human behavior. Cognitive psychologists view human behavior as influenced by internal processes, including thoughts, perceptions, memory, and problem solving in explaining how individuals process information and how this leads to diverse behavioral responses. Founded by Sigmund Freud in the late 19th century, the psychodynamic perspective emphasizes the impact of the unconscious mind and our childhood experiences on our behavior. The psychodynamic approach attempts to explain human behavior through unconscious motivations and conflicts rooted in childhood, suggesting that unresolved past conflicts shape current behaviors and even mental disorders. Emerging in the 1950s as a response to both behaviorism and psychodynamic theories, the humanistic perspective brought on by Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow focused on individual potential and growth. Humanistic psychologists emphasize personal growth and the inherent potential of each individual. It focuses on our ability to make rational choices and to develop our fullest potential. The biological perspective gained popularity with technological advances in neuroscience, genetics research, and psychopharmacology through the 20th century, highlighting the physical and biological basis of behavior. Biological psychologists explain behavior through our brain structures, chemicals, and genetic makeup, proposing that biological processes and brain activity are fundamental to understanding human behavior and mental processes. Drawing from Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection, the evolutionary perspective brings the principles of evolutionary biology into the realm of psychology. This approach, which began to gain prominence in the late 20th century, 
examines how evolutionary history shapes our psychological traits and behaviors. This perspective explains behavior as adaptations that have evolved to solve problems of survival and reproduction, suggesting that many common behaviors today have evolutionary purposes. The sociocultural perspective, which emerged in the mid 20th century and was heavily influenced by psychologists such as Lev Vygotsky, focuses on how social interaction and cultural context play critical roles in our development. This approach highlights how our behaviors and ways of thinking are shaped by the society and culture surrounding us. The sociocultural perspective explains behavior as heavily influenced by the social environment and cultural norms, suggesting that our interactions and the cultural groups to which we belong shape our behaviors and our psychological processes. All right, so now that we've explored the modern perspectives, let's see how each of these theories play out in the real world. Remember, in order to do well on the AP Psych Test, not only do you need to know how each modern perspective explains behavior, but also how to apply them to real world situations. And to help with that, I want you to imagine the following scenario. At Westfield High, the annual charity marathon is a highlight of the school year, and Kevin has volunteered to help organize the event every year since he was a freshman. This year, however, Kevin seems less enthusiastic and eventually stops showing up to the planning meetings altogether without explanation. His friends and fellow organizers, Maya and Lucas, are puzzled by his sudden change in behavior, considering how passionate Kevin used to be about the event. All right, now I want you to imagine there is a room, and in this room, there are seven psychologists, all of them experts in their own specific perspective. If these psychologists were given this scenario, how do you think that they would explain Kevin's behavior? Well, a behavioral psychologist might state that Kevin's withdrawal from helping plan for the marathon could be explained by a change in the reinforcements associated with him helping. Maybe in previous years, Kevin received a lot of praise and recognition from his teachers and peers for his efforts, which served as a strong positive reinforcement. Now this lack of positive feedback could be one of the reasons that Kevin is not participating as much as he used to. On the other hand, a cognitive psychologist might suggest that Kevin's thoughts and beliefs about the marathon have changed. If Kevin started to think that volunteering wasn't worth his time anymore, or thinking that the planning process as increasingly stressful and unrewarding, these negative thoughts could influence his decision to distance himself from an activity that no longer brings him satisfaction or value. Now, according to the psychodynamic perspective, there could be unconscious conflicts or unresolved issues driving Kevin's behavior. It is possible that Kevin is experiencing internal stress from specific pressures, such as demanding schoolwork, college applications, or even family responsibilities that he is not fully taken care of. These pressures could be overwhelming him, leading him to withdraw from activities he previously enjoyed, such as the marathon planning. Alternatively, a humanistic psychologist might suggest that Kevin's disengagement signals a feeling that volunteering no longer supports his personal growth. It is possible that he is feeling undervalued and unappreciated, which could lead him to withdrawing and looking for fulfillment in other areas. A biological psychologist would likely explore the physiological factors behind Kevin's change in behavior, such as chemical imbalances or neurological changes that could be influencing his mood and energy levels. If Kevin is experiencing increased stress or the onset of a mood disorder, this could significantly reduce his motivation and participation in activities he previously enjoyed. An evolutionary psychologist might view Kevin's withdrawal from the marathon planning as a strategic adaptation to conserve resources for activities with greater personal benefits. If his involvement no longer enhances his social status or offers significant rewards, he may instinctively focus his efforts on alternatives that promise more substantial returns, such as academics or new social connections. This behavior aligns with the evolutionary principles prioritizing activities that maximize personal and reproductive advantages. A sociocultural psychologist would examine how changes in Kevin's social environment or cultural influences might be affecting his behavior towards the marathon planning. They might consider whether shifts in peer attitudes, family expectations, or community values regarding volunteerism are impacting his enthusiasm and commitment. All right, now that we've taken a look at how the various psychological perspectives explain behaviors, we're now going to shift our focus to another crucial component of our first science practice, which is going to be understanding how our cultural norms, expectations, individual circumstances, and cognitive biases can shape our behavior. So let's get started with cultural norms and expectations. These are just going to be the shared rules that a group holds about what kind of behaviors are acceptable 
and which ones are unacceptable. Cultural norms deeply influence our behavior, often subconsciously. For example, if volunteering is highly valued in Kevin's community, his withdrawal might not just affect him personally, but could also negatively impact how he's perceived by others within his community. Circumstances, including the specific situations we find ourselves in, also have a powerful impact on influencing our behavior. For Kevin, perhaps changes in his life circumstances, such as increased academic pressures or family responsibilities, have made it challenging for him to dedicate time to the marathon planning, making it difficult for him to volunteer. Then we have cognitive biases. These are going to be errors in thinking that affect our decisions and judgments. There are numerous cognitive biases out there, and as you're about to discover, no matter how smart we think we are, there's always going to be a bias lurking that can catch us off guard. Confirmation bias is our tendency to search for or favor information that confirms things that we want to believe to be fact. It means we might give more weight to evidence that supports our views and overlook or undervalue information that goes against them. In Kevin's case, if he believes his efforts are no longer impactful, he might only notice instances that support this view. Like if his suggestions for the marathon were being ignored, while overlooking any positive feedback he may have received. This bias can reinforce his decision to withdraw from the marathon. Hindsight bias, or the I knew it all along effect, occurs when we believe after an event has occurred that we had accurately predicted it, even though there was no real evidence beforehand. Now Kevin's friends might fall into this bias by believing he could have foreseen him quitting, thinking back to any small signs as proof such as times that Kevin may have seemed distracted at meetings or maybe a comment he made about feeling stressed out, viewing these signs as warnings they may have missed. This could change how they feel about Kevin, leading them to feel less sympathetic towards Kevin, or even feeling betrayed or annoyed with his actions. Hindsight bias leads to overconfidence, which is when we overestimate our abilities to predict or control the outcomes of an event or situation. With Kevin gone and his friends upset, they might start to become overly confident in their ability to handle the marathon planning without him, underestimating the impact of him not being there and potentially facing challenges they're not prepared for. All right, cool. So we're done with Kevin, and we have successfully applied psychological principles to a scenario. Give yourself a pat on the back for a job well done. But wait. There's more. Now the final component of Science Practice 1 involves taking a look at and properly understanding how psychological concepts or theories can be applied inappropriately or discriminately. This means we need to be aware of how these theories can sometimes be misused to support biased, stereotypical, or harmful views. An example being how some intelligence tests in the past were unfairly administered to show differences in intellectual capabilities between races in an attempt to justify discriminatory policies. Throughout the course, we're encouraged to think critically about the role of psychology in society and to ensure that its application is responsible and informed. By doing so, we can help make sure that the science is used to enhance our understanding of human behavior, not to perpetuate harm or injustice. All right, so that's a wrap on today's psychological review. Now, remember, thinking that you've mastered the content after watching one review video is like thinking you're good at cooking just because you didn't burn your house down while frying an egg. Optimistic, yes, but let's not get carried away. So be sure to take time reviewing and staying up to date with the content you learned throughout the reviews. And with that being said, this concludes our review on Science Practice 1. I will see you all next time for our review of Science Practice 2, Research Methods and Design. Until then, peace. Oh, I didn't see you there. You spooked me. Well, if you're still here, you must be looking for the psychological explanation as to why your TikTok videos don't go viral. So since this is the first video, I will keep it for you in elementary terms. It appears you haven't quite mastered the intricacies of psychological engagement. Your content likely lacks the necessary stimuli to trigger the dopaminergic pathways essential for viewer retention and virality. Perhaps you're failing to create the optimal arousal levels, thereby not activating the audience's limbic system effectively. And furthermore, your videos may not be engaging enough to surpass the threshold of the hedonic treadmill, leaving viewers unimpressed. So let's face it, without tapping into the core psychological principles of attention, emotional resonance, and cognitive dissonance, your content will remain in the abyss of mediocrity. So it seems you have a lot to learn about harnessing the subconscious triggers that drive viral success. 
Better luck next time, assuming you can grasp these fundamental concepts. <laughs> now, go forth and create content that truly captivates the psychological core of your audience. Or, you know, just add a cute cat. That seems to work too.